Okay, good evening and welcome everyone. My name is Donna Katsopoulos and I'm so pleased and proud to serve Western as the Dean of Education. Uh, we're so pleased to welcome alumni, community members and friends of Western University to the Faculty of Education's Community Speaker Series. I'd like to begin with a land acknowledgement followed by some housekeeping details and then I will be very honored to introduce our speaker for the evening. So to begin with, as educators and as an institution, we see our responsibility to teach and lead with reconciliation at the forefront of our thinking. So I'd like to acknowledge that Western University is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Lenapewak, and Shinocton nations on lands connected with the London Township and the Songer Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon Covenant Wampum. Dish with one spoon means we're all eating from one spoon with one dish with one spoon. And it's a reminder of our collective responsibility to have respect and care for this land that was shared with us by indigenous people. So to begin with, I'd like to just say, before we get into our, our talk this evening, uh, we welcome you to the conversation. So please feel very welcome as you hear the talk this evening to enter any of your questions in the Q and A link below. We'll have about 15 minutes at the end of the hour to answer any questions that may come up. And so without further delay, it is a real sincere honor uh, to welcome this evening, Dr. Melody Vitsko, who's an associate professor in the field of critical policy, equity and leadership studies at the Faculty of Education. She is a deeply esteemed and respected colleague and I'm so honored that she's going, going to be joining us this evening. She's an experienced and respected researcher her current work relates to governance of higher education by looking at the ways that different state and non-state entities interact with each other through policy. Tonight, she's gonna to be talking about, about the pandemic and sort of the lasting impacts that have resulted because of the pandemic. And we're very much looking forward to hearing what she has to say and engaging in discussion afterwards. So without further delay, thank you, Melody, for being here and for sharing your wisdom and time with us this evening. It's my pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Donna, for such a warm welcome and, and, and to the people who've supported us today um, at Faculty Relations, at, um, at Western Alumni and in the Faculty of Education, as well as um, research assistants I work with in my own work. It's been great to have, to build up to this day. So thanks to everyone for your support. Um, I'm gonna start today also, um, with a little introduction to myself. So I am, uh, as Donna said, a professor in the Faculty of Education. Uh, my background is a teacher. I, I have 20 plus years of, of um, K to 12 school uh, experience teaching. Um, I'm a teacher at heart. I, I very much enjoy uh, the transitions I've made in my career from teaching in, in schools in Saskatchewan, in Alberta, in England and in Romania towards um, taking graduate school studies, thinking I would go back to the field to continue my work as an educational leader and staying on to do my PhD and ended up um, becoming a professor. So a different kind of teaching. I teach teachers as my children likes, like to say. I, I also wanna start the presentation with a, a brief introduction to say, I'm a really interactive person. And so for me to, um, I'm just going to move something here, everybody. For me to be doing a presentation on a webinar, this is this is not something I'm used to doing. So I'm much more used to having an interactive space where I can talk with people and um, I get the feedback. So if I tell a jokes, I know who's reacting to it. Um, <clears throat> but you don't always get that when you're in a webinar and, and today we don't. So um, I'll do my best to, uh, to reach out and to sort of... Um, interact with you and help you feel like we are together in one room sharing this presentation. So the topic for the title for my presentation is everything everywhere all at once. As you know, this is you may know, this is the name of a film that became quite popular, a quite well celebrated film, an award winning film. <clears throat> when the title of the film, uh, when I first heard the title of the film, it, it resonated with me so much. I was deep in doing research around the pandemic. I was deep living the experience of being a faculty member, a teacher, a parent, a partner, a colleague, a neighbor in the pandemic. And this expression resonated so much with me. Everything, everywhere, all at once. Is this what it's been like? 
for us in the pandemic. And so I, I captured that title. So my presentation doesn't have anything to do today with the, the topic of the film, maybe. Maybe if we have film um, experts in the room or um, media studies students, they can help us make connections. But um, my association with this title was the ways in which it resonated with me. It captured this narrative I heard over and over again from students in research, which was the overwhelmingness of students' um, experiences as they try to make sense of who they were, how they learn, what they want for their future uh, during the pandemic. And of course, who I am as a researcher, as a qualitative researcher, who I am as a researcher is very much informed by who I am as a person, as a human. And so I want to start today with a little story for you, my, one of my favorite stories about the pandemic. And that is uh, a story about children and learning. So um, like many people here, perhaps, we spent the first part of the pandemic learning how to learn and work together in new spaces, in our home, um, in our backyard, um, in, in kids' bedrooms, as they may had makeshift desks under tables, uh, as they found new places to read and to, to um, explore their time while their parents were working. And so one of the things that was really striking for me, one of the stories that stayed with me so much is the ways in which the two children uh, that live in my house talked about work. And so when the pandemic began and we sat down, my partner and I sat down at our laptops to begin our work, the children who were at the time, I think they were three and seven, maybe three and six, said to us, that's what you do, that's your job, that's all you do is sit at a computer. So we never captured what we thought, what they thought we did. I wished we had, it would be a, really, it would be a much better story even if we knew what they had thought that we did for, for jobs and for work. Um, but, but we heard it from them quite a bit. You're not working, that's all you do, you sit at a computer. But of course, as time went by, as I say, we learned to read together um, while working. We learned how to portion and part section off our time to be able to find the time to make sure our work was getting done, the children was, were safe and happy and learning, and we balanced this time. Um, I remember having colleagues say, I can't believe you're sending emails at three in the morning and me saying, when do you think people are working who have children? This is, this is how we're balancing our lives. As time went by and we learned to do these things, the narratives from the children around our work changed. And that is, they started to say, you're always working. And so from this disbelief and sort of surprise that this is what we, this is my work at a computer for them was hardly working. And they came to see that we were in fact always working. And so their ideas around work, their ideas around labor, their ideas around um, how we spend our time certainly changed over the, the period of that pandemic. One day I will publish this story into something. And so don't steal it from me. It might end up in the Reader's Digest somewhere as a short story. I don't know if this even still exists, um, but, but it's, it's been one of my favorite sort of stories to keep about ourselves during the pandemic. The subtitle of the study of, of this presentation today is How Students' Pandemic Experiences Can Change Education. And the main, the main takeaway I want everyone to leave with today is the story that, um, there's lots for us to learn through the pandemic and that the return to normal and the push for us to get back to normal has taken away some things that we do need to bring forward with us, things we've learned from students, things the pandemic due to its very nature and structure has set up for us and the ways in which we can learn from students about that and how that can improve our education. Um, so this is a, store, a slide that captures the sort of space in which our, our, my headspace of being in the pandemic. Um, as you know, there's, there's this, the spaces were closed off for us. Another one of these pictures is one that uh, a PhD student that I work with, Mara, 
uh, created around the different sort of discourses that exist in the pandemic. And of course, there's this picture of this person working at a computer space with a mask. And this is to remind us about this is what the pandemic was like for us. But why study the pandemic then? And particularly, why study the policies of the pandemic? Well, it's my sort of um, argument that understanding what's going on during the pandemic can in fact help us to make better policy, better policy around learning, better policy around education. But this is based on two presuppositions I bring, and I'm gonna explain them a little bit to you And before I jump into the sort of research presentation. I'm a policy scholar. I teach policy to students. I love it. So as a policy, as a policy person though, I'm used to having to justify a little bit the, um, the ways in which, which policy research is exciting and is important and helpful for us. It's not, it's not everyone's jam to do a policy research. So my two presuppositions are this, policy is not boring. And the second thing, and I agree and I align myself with researchers such as Paul Kearney, who argue that policymakers don't make decisions in ideal, they don't make decisions in ideal conditions and they can use our help as policy scholars. And we have a role in, in helping with policy decisions. So let's go to the first presupposition. Policy is not boring. I promise you it's not. So in teaching about policy to students I work with, we always take up sort of definitions at the beginning. What is policy? How should we think about it? And I always talk about the ways in which policy is a fundamental organizing principle in our society. Think about it. It provides the whole way in which people conceptualize and symbolize their social relations. Our whole lives and our whole realities get structured around policy. So in fact, policy does a lot. It organizes us, it classifies us, it categorizes us, it categorizes our ideas. And that means that policies are powerful means for social change. So I repeat that policies are powerful means for social change. And when I teach policy to students, I ask them, can you give me an example? If we were in an open room today having a presentation that wasn't an online webinar, I'd be asking you, think about some examples. What are some ways in which policies classify and organize and categorize people? So one of the examples I give to students is the categories in the context of education, the categories that we use around international and domestic students. It's one that's been in the media quite a bit lately. This idea that we have international students and we have domestic students is a category that exists out of policy. And we categorize students in this way and we might think about it as being inconsequential, but in fact, it's not. The category of domestic and international students provides hierarchies. It provides boundaries upon who has services, who has access to which service, how much tuition people pay, Hey, which kind of awards are you eligible to apply for? How do you access basic things like social services? These sorts of things get, our, our lives get organized by the categories that get created, such as international and domestic student in, in the context of a university. In the context of K-12 education, we might think about, well, school boundaries are a huge policy. Who gets to attend which school under, what condi under which conditions? So if you live in a certain area, you have access to a particular school. If you don't live within the boundaries of that designed area, designated area, in fact, your access to that school would be limited. So we see then students are categorized. They become, in fact, we might, we do talk about them as policy subjects, as insiders and outsiders. We, um, <clears throat> we talk about the hierarchies that get formed through these categories and the power that comes from such categories. Policies aren't boring. The second presupposition then is that critical policy studies is what we need. And so this isn't just the study of policy, it's a kind of orientation to studying policy that says, and this is Paul Kearney's work I draw on to share this, to say that policymakers make decisions in conditions that aren't ideal. They operate in this bounded rationality of policy. Policymakers, don't always have all the information that they need to make good decisions. They often have limited information or they don't have access to other information that's out there. Part of that is our job as, policy, as scholars is to get that information to them, researchers. 
but they might not have the capacity to understand all of that information. Researchers don't always do a good job of breaking it down into a way that's accessible to people outside the confines of the academic community. We have to do better at that. Um, they might not also, because of their skill set, they might not have the capacities to understand or the particular skills to be trained to understand information. They might, they might in fact, be interfered with all the time because of politics and agendas and issues. So the information might be there, but the conditions to make it are certainly not free from politics and power and negotiations. And there's not always time, and this was certainly something through the pandemic, there's not always time to make the decisions that we'd like to make. And sometimes we have to do them quickly. And that's part of the learning we have to do through the pandemic is to understand in those conditions where we understandably made decisions quickly, what were the outcomes for our students? What can we learn about how they've experienced those things and make sure that we do better on the other side? So I draw on a field called critical policy studies in which, for example, Young and Diem argue that we assume there to always be a gap between what's written in policy and how it gets translated into practice in our organizations and in our lives. We don't think that's a failure of policy. We think that happens all the time. That's just natural in the way policy takes place. So there's going to always be a gap between rhetoric and practice. We want to understand what happens in that gap. We want to be concerned with who benefits from policy, whose interests are included, and whose interests are excluded. And social justice principles then are really important and are required to better understand policy as it takes place in practice. So I go back to this idea that policy is not boring, and I want to share with you some examples of work we've done through the pandemic related to policy. So um, as the pandemic... Uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna call it an outbreak because I can't think of a better word off the top of my head. As the, the pandemic unfolded before us, um, we started hearing about challenges students were going to have, graduate students in particular might have uh, faced in doing their research. And so through my uh, research projects, I decided to bring together um, several PhD students who I worked with to say, we've got data we can use. We can look at university policy during the pandemic and we can design studies to understand what's going on with policy during the pandemic. And so um, the students and I designed several projects. We've published on them. Some students have used them in their own research to be able to uh, uh, publish their own work. It informs their, their uh, PhD studies. And so these are some examples of some of the work we've done. So um, they're, they're placed there on the screen. They're not going to be the focus of my presentation today, and I'm, but I'm certainly um, happy to talk about any of them with you. You can visit my website, um, which I can share with the group after, in which you can see some of the results from the research we've been working on. The, st the study I want to talk to you today is about um, students and employability through digital technology during the pandemic. Um, This study emerged in a time where we heard a lot of concern being raised for students and their ability to find work, their ability to find employment, but not just employment. Our understanding of employability in this study draws more, more draws on a concept of employability that's more than just about finding work. It's about more than employment. It's about how students understand and envision themselves in a space as they leave post-secondary schooling. So students move from the space of formal education into things like work, into um, their, their, their lives in which they will become citizens who make decisions and participate in society beyond their studies, because they certainly do it while they're here studying as well. Employability for us was quite broad, but the context in which the concerns for this study emerged involved some of the statistics you see in front of us. The Canadian government um, did a, a crowd, they crowdsourced data through a study, a quick way to find information. They, they um, talked to over 100,000 students between April 19th and May 1st, 2020, the beginning when the pandemic was declared. They wanted to understand about the impact on student academic labor market and finances. The results were concerning. And it's in the context of this that, that I began to seek out this study. 
67% of students reported being very or extremely worried about having no job prospects. 63% expressed a high level of concern about the loss of job. 54% were concerned about having to take on more student debt. 35% of students reported delay or cancellation of their planned work placements that were part of their programs for which they could receive employment and pay, but also um, accrue credit for their programs in order to, to have timely completion. In April 2020, the employment rate of students between age 20 and 24 in Canada was 29.8%. Now that was compared to only two months ago where the employment rate was 52.5%. And I, I put in brackets there to say, yes, students work during their studies. The majority of students work during their studies. Um, so the, the there was great concern about what was happening to students around their employment. So now I want to ask your involvement in this presentation today. What do you think? True or false? Canada, the employment rate for those aged 15 to 24 year, years old who obtained a university bachelor degree kept declining over the course of the pandemic. What do you think? True or false? So you can go ahead and click on the answer on the screen. And we'll show you the results of your poll and then I'll tell you the answer to the question. We'll give you all some time to complete. So the results should be popping up on your screen as well as mine. So people thought true. 76% of people in our presentation today uh, believe that the uh, employment rates kept declining over the course of the pandemic. Well, that's false, and I'll show you some data about that. What we do know is that the employment rate of those aged 15 to 24 who had at least a bachelor degree um, did dip. You can see the dip. So between uh, 2019, this comes from a stats can study in 2023, or the results were published in 2023. Um, in 2019, we had a 77.6% rate of employment. It dropped down to an average of 66.1% but it increased in 2021 and it got close to the same rate that it was um, pre-pandemic in 2022. The 2023 results weren't released, but we might expect them to continue to increase. Other contextual factors related to the study. Bertrand et al. did a study of university students at the University of Saskatchewan and at Regina. Uh, during COVID-19, university students, they found that university students' nutrient and caloric intakes decreased, alcohol in intake increased significantly, and physical activity levels decreased, sedentary activity increased significantly during COVID-19. These are the conditions in which students were experiencing studies. Appleby uh, and colleagues did a, a survey about students' experiences and concerns during the pandemic. And they looked at undergraduate students from Queen's University and from the University of Oxford. So they completed a survey, 78.9% of Queen's students and 50.4% of first year Oxford students reported worries about the long-term impact of their academic, job pros academic and job prospects. Almost 30% of Queen's students and 14% of Oxford students reported the pandemic negatively impacted their plans to continue to university. So this is about university interruption. 30% of students at Queen's. The, um, the group called you know, Undergraduates of Canadian Research Intensive Universities also conducted a study among their members. And they, uh, they spoke to students in, or they, they conducted a survey with students in 64 institutions. And here's what they found out. 73% of students were concerned about making their summer rent and utility bill payments. 71% were concerned about paying for groceries. 66% were concerned about credit card. Almost 80% were concerned about how they're going to pay for tuition in the fall. 
Um, 75% about how they'll pay for fall and ut- fall rent and utilities. 23% of students had their jobs canceled or delayed due to COVID. And 83% of students at that time did not qualify for CERB. So this was a federal government support for students. Um, they did not, uh, pardon me, for, for the public, they did not qualify for it based on their elig- the elig- eligibility requirements at that time. So that is, they didn't qualify for some of the support, social support systems that were put in place for people during the pandemic. One last slide I want to share with you as well um, from that same study where they uh, they conducted a survey, but they also talked and interviewed students. And one of the students from Western um, who participated in the study had this to say. My mother passed away last year. She was a single parent, so gone with her. I have no family support financially or any way to st- anywhere to stay if I can't pay rent. I have no income. At the moment, I don't qualify for EI or the CERB. I don't have enough hours um, and I don't don't make enough money. So both my jobs, my work study and my external jobs were closed. I'm supposed to be taking courses over the summer and in September, but right now I can't even buy groceries, let alone thinking about paying for tuition. So this is a a quote that really shows some of the, the distress and the challenging conditions upon which students found themselves during the pandemic. And in light of this, I decided to conduct a a study that looked at students' experiences around employability during the pandemic as they engaged with digital technology. So we asked them to talk to us. We designed a small little pilot study from which we could um, build to to a, a more fulsome study using situational analysis. So we interviewed six university students. We asked them to explain to us, to describe, to show us how they use different technologies to support employability. We asked them to give us um, descriptions about the ways in which technologies, the discourses and pressures they were facing, the materials they were engaged with, the things they had um, in their lives. We asked them to talk to us about those things. We wanted thick descriptions about what their lives were like. We asked them to to complete a pre-interview activity and they brought that to us. It was um, something that they they wrote down and we created digital visualizations with a digital graphic artist who rendered images for us of what it was like for students during the pandemic. And we conducted interviews. We talked to students about the difficult to tell stories asking them to tell us about their perceptions of the complex conditions of the pandemic. We asked them to talk to us about their engagement with digital technology as they were concerned with employability. So we used this method of drawing. We asked students to tell us about what it was like. And we worked with our digital graphic artists to render these pictures, to give us sort of big picture thinking around this uh, situation for students. Our goal is to be able to translate these images into documents to go back to the critical policy piece, to translate these visualizations into documents and and research and knowledge, policy knowledge that policymakers can use to inform their, their own decisions around student education and student learning, knowing what we've learned from students in the pandemic. So here's one of our um, images and I'm, I'm gonna ask for your participation again today. Here's one of the renderings we've drawn. What do you see in this image? Let me move my thing. I'm not sure if it's interrupting with you, but I'm gonna pull it over here. What do you see? Is this an image of this is never ending? Work, work, work. Do you see that the cup is too, the coffee cup is too small. There's not enough coffee in this space. Or is there a question from this person about who am I? Which image represents, which caption represents this image? Go ahead and take a vote. And just like the earlier poll, I'll share it with you once we're done.
So our most popular answer here was work, work, work. 40% of people said this. 33% um, of people said this is never ending. 20% um, said, who am I? And only 7% thought the coffee cup was too small. This is the image you got. Um, thanks everyone for that. Now, of course, this uh, is a little bit, I've set you up a little bit here because it's of course all of these things. And so these are some things we heard from students um, in our interviews with students. One student said, I would just say that this, I would just say that the feeling was this, that this will never end. We heard this so much from students over and over again, and that we're all kind of stuck. It's like we're frozen in time. And when I felt that way, it was really hard for me to seek out future endeavors and future opportunities because it just felt, everything I was feeling in this moment just felt like it was never gonna end. We talk about this choreography of loss and I'll, I'll explain some of that um, a few slides down the road here. Another thing we heard from students was this expression um, around that everyone's dealing with everything all at one time. And so one of the participants said, I have mixed opinions about my remote internships. This is a student who did many internships at one time. So because they were able to, um, because of the, the, the ways in which their study was very much offline, their, their studies happened offline, they would complete their work and then submit it sort of in asynchronous sessions. Um, the students talked about, this one particular student talked about her ability to complete several internships at one time. And so normally in a program, you might, you might do one. Um, but she said, I had so much free time. So I just applied for it and sought out as many opportunities as I could to do internships. What else was I going to do during this time? So I just sought to fill my time with these internships. In fact, she had some internationally, she had some locally, and because of the time change, she was effectively able to work around the clock. So in this image, we have the sun moving to the moon and this image of the student working nonstop. I have mixed opinions about my remote internships, they said, because on paper, it looks like I achieved a lot. And although I can't discredit what I did because they were very remote in nature, the workload was very, very minimal. And that's why I was able to balance that with having full-time course study. Because they were remote, I hardly established any network or connections with anybody. Because I think everyone just really kind of didn't care everyone was stuck at home. No one really felt the importance of making that connection with interns because I don't know, everyone's just dealing with their own stuff, right? So on paper, I built my resume to the absolute nines during this pandemic, but in reality, I feel like I didn't benefit at all. So there was this choreography of loss for this student, this expression of, of even in the face of finding options, feeling empty and feeling like, feeling disconnection. Another image we have of a student, we asked students to tell us um, a metaphor about, they had to use a metaphor to describe what their experience was like. Another student talked about, um, it's like the forest is burning and we're all trying to deal with this while this, this fire is going on. And so this person talked about um, having to balance all of these things. So some of these images on here, I'm not sure how well you all can read them, but there's a repeating message about staying inside. So um, this, this, there are, the students are under lock, lockdown. How to have a successful internship? Stay inside. How to support um, student, students as leaders? Stay inside. There was this sort of repeated message. And as you can see, they're balancing all these kinds of, of tasks and responsibilities and roles that they might have. So they talk about being on Senate, on student council, having leadership, all of these things they're trying to do to build themselves um, and that all tumbling into a fire. Figure it out, says the one on the floor, figure it out. This was something we heard from students. And so our, again, uh, this talented digital graphic artist, Malvika um, Agarwal, uh, created this image for us. One of the student leaders we talked about, <clears throat> talked to, um, this person engaged in, in leadership work. We asked about how the pandemic's changed, who, how they think about themselves. And this, this person said unequivocally, yes, the pandemic changed who I am and how I think about my community, how I consider what makes a good leader. 
for most of my life, and probably like most of us who grew up in the Western world, we've become so enmeshed in concepts of individuality being the way we just think about everything. I spent my whole life thinking about myself as an individual. I'm thinking about what I want, what I think, what my likes are, my dislikes, you know, thinking about myself in individual terms. But the experience of moving through the pandemic helped me to see beyond that if that makes sense, to consider that there are other frameworks for knowing how I'm connected to the world, not just as an individual, but as part of movements, as very deeply connected to community, as deeply connected to the land that I live on. I don't, I don't think that that's something I would have come to without the pandemic and without my involvement in anti-violence movements and student governments, they gave me spaces to explore community. They showed me what alternatives to thinking in terms of individuals looks like. And there's been a lot of, you know, other experiences and concepts that have helped me to understand that I don't need to think about myself as an individual. But that shift definitely occurred for me during the pandemic. So we were really curious. This was an anomaly. This was not something we heard from many of the students. It's not something we've heard throughout the many hours we conducted research, interviews. We asked, do you think others felt that way too? And the student said, no, most of the people that I've spoken to have sort of shared the opposite thing. They feel isolated or it's been harder to access community or to think about things in communal terms because of social isolation. But also just the way that we're kind of coming to see community now. I see it in the way that my peers are showing up as well as they did pre-pandemic. I can tell you that student government and our student clubs were absolutely places where there were deeper engagement and people were really invested. People were passionate. And it's not, it's not that we don't have the same numbers as we did before, but it feels like people are not as deeply invested or passionate or oriented around community anymore. And from the conversations I've had, that's the sense I, that I get. But I think the op that isolation actually had the opposite effect for me. This person went on to say, then to say, you know, it's disappointing. I agree with you that there's a question of like, can, can we afford to do two things? especially when government funding's not coming in and institutions are relying on student tuition and therefore institutions are going to be thinking about things like installing new Starbucks and, you know, renovating a student recreation center. I'm not saying those aren't good things. I like Starbucks, but I'm here for an education. You know, I'm here to be taught to think critically. These are just some of the quotes of things we heard from students through the pandemic. Overwhelmingly, we heard this story from students about balancing the isolation with finding meaningful interactions for themselves, seeking out what that would look like. The students who we talked to, the six students we talked to, were incredibly fortunate. They recognized the privilege they carried for themselves. Um, they were certain, they, in my mind, they represent a small population. I mean, of course, the numbers are really small. And we've thought, we've thought about the ways in which we have to incorporate um, a variety of perspectives into the study, but we've been able to learn from them about things that, that they've experienced around learning, around isolation, around interaction, that, can, that have informed my thinking about what we need to be doing in education and in teaching and learning at, at the university level. One of the things I found quite surprising for student, from students was the overwhelming message that they spent time learning alone. And so finally, I asked one student, I said to them, I, I just need to understand, are you telling me that you never had any interactions with the, the faculty members, the professors who were teaching you? And they said, no, she said, no. And I said, well, like, didn't, didn't people have like classroom hours where you met with them? Weren't you meeting at some point, even online, sort of face to face through virtual spaces? And this, this, this student said, I don't know what you think was happening, but it was us alone in our bedrooms with material, with reams and reams of material. And we had to learn that on our own. So this, I, knowing this, when we interact with our students moving forward, knowing this was their experience, um, it really makes me think about the ways in which we have to understand the kinds of ways in which these students experience loss how they, they learned about uh, care as individuals in a system and how we as educators need to be creating the spaces for them to be able to bring forward um, their own ways in which they found themselves through, through the pandemic. Another student shared very much for us, a student who, who 
talked about herself as having a disability, spoke about the ways in which the pandemic offered her incredible learning opportunities. So having the opportunity to revisit material that's been recorded, the opportunity to uh, watch videos again, the opportunity to have notes, um, to have videos that where someone was lecturing and there were captions on the screen. And she talked about the incredible access this gave her to education, that even herself had not thought about it as something that could be helpful or useful during the pandemic. And her frustration in returning uh, to other forms of schooling now where that wasn't where that wasn't accessed. And in fact, um, she used an expression about how um, haven't we learned anything in this process? And so, as I say, these stories that we've heard from students are things we want to use these visualizations to create um, opportunities to share of course, through things that we as researchers will have to do, like journal article publications, but also re research material, um, policy knowledge that we can share to um, people who are making decisions about what education should look like um, in these sort of post-pandemic period that we move. Theoretically, um, we've talked about looking to understand the student's world through a, a, a metaphor of choreography, how all of this ide these ideas around care and separation and loss actually came about. And that um, John Law uses this idea of choreography to talk about the ways in which um, an extreme degree of effort goes into organization, into organizing how things are. Sometimes it appears so simple from the outside, um, but it's never that way in practice. And so for us, we're wanting to use um, this idea of, of choreography of loss and understanding how students experience loss and the ways in which they came to deal with it through, through the pandemic. I'm running out of time on my presentation and I wanna move into a few last slides. Um, so the next steps then are to translate these images into policy brief communications to share with policymakers that tell the story of student learning in the pandemic. We want to uh, share research knowledge that can support decision making. Our critical policy studies is going to ask the questions about who benefited from the ways in which we learned, who benefited from the ways in which we carried out education in ways that we might not expect. We need to talk to more students. We have to spend time um, understanding their transitions back to um, learning in person and what that was like for them in order, in order that the things students have accumulated as knowledge by their experiences through the pandemic, don't become lost, that we're able to take them forward and, and use them in how we plan and think about our research, um, think about our, our teaching with them. So as we sort of end, and I'm gonna stop sharing my slide today, I want you to think about um, something that you learned about today. Do you have any feedback for me on things that you've learned? You can use the chat box to communicate that to us, what was memorable for you. And I also want to make sure that I spend some time to thank the, um, the very talented PhD students who worked with me on projects this past summer, uh, Shannon McKechnie, Hanata Matsumoto, Mara Bordigno, Rajender Singh, and Malvika Argarwal, who worked with us on the, um, the big, large uh, pandemic project I was talking to you about. I'm going to move back to this space now. Don, I pass it over to you. Thank you, Melody. Thank you. Uh, I was really captiv captivated by the voices of the students, mm -hmm. and and immediately, immediately hearing their thoughts, having you share their thoughts, really brought me right back to the pandemic, mm -hmm. and um, and just this understanding of how different our experiences were, and and it was. And it was particularly powerful to read about that student who'd lost his mother and mm -hmm. and and was now now um, struggling to figure out how that they were going to make ends meet just basically in terms of food and shelter. Mm -hmm. uh, and I and I can see that some of our comments that are coming in about how powerful the visual images were, mm -hmm. and and how um, much content and thinking was represented in those images. So. Um, I'll begin the question and answer and discussion period by just thanking you for, for inviting us into your thinking and for really insightful comments about the pandemic and students, but also the intersection of, of policy as, as a change maker. 
mm-hmm. and and what this means, what what the experiences of these students mean for education going forward, and how it can shape policy. Um, and I, I was also particularly drawn by your comment that uh, policy is often made and not not in ideal settings or ideal contexts, and and that nothing, nothing more true could nothing could be more true. Um, so, so there's a couple of questions. I'll start with a one from one from our uh, our guests this afternoon, this evening. Excuse me. Um, what are your thoughts, Melody? Do you think the question is, do you think we were ready for the pandemic? But what I'd like to say is, I'd also like to reframe it. Did we get any better at doing the pandemic as it went along? So I think one of the, it's it's hard to know, right? So this is hard to know. And I remember, I remember when we had a faculty council, I mean, this is speaking at the university level, when we had a faculty council saying, we need to be studying this as we're going through this. It's really important that we capture what are we doing? How well are we doing it? What's the experience like for students? Um, Because we can learn something from this. In fact, um, it it will be really important for us. I don't know so much if we can ever really capture if we got better at doing it because so much changed, right? It wasn't just the environment of our classrooms. Instructors got better at teaching, presumably online, hopefully. Students became more accustomed to that learning environment. Um, We became much, I mean, when when I think about preparing for this presentation even, I went back through the student data and was reminded just by listening to their the quotes we have from students was reminded about how stressful this time was for us and for them. And we became, some of us, I mean, not all of us, right? This is important. Not all of us got better at coping in the pandemic. Um, and we certainly carry it. We, we, we often talk about the fatigue, right? Decision fatigue we had at the time, but also the fatigue around the constant uncertainty. And, and people talk about um, the anticipatory grief we carried about not knowing what we were even going to be losing in the future, right? Some of the early um, surveys we data we showed um, indicated exactly that students were worried about losing their job. And the data shows actually lots of their employments, lots of the employment levels uh, recuperated, but in fact, students were worried about this. And and so did we get better? I, I, I can't, I don't know if we did get better. I, it's something to ask students. I mean, we have to keep asking them about that experience, right? Um, What have we learned through the pandemic? What are we changing in the ways that we're teaching that we've really given time to learn from students about what they need as as learners and us as educators? We need to get people back together, I think, for that to happen. That's a personal thought and certainly not a, you know, that's a personal reflection, yeah. One one interesting thing that I'll share with you and with our with our guests this evening is I was with the one of the directors of our of our local school board partners and we were talking about online education and there was a real belief during the pandemic that this there was this this was going to start an incredible trend and Absolutely. and that online education was going to be the way back and at the time I remember thinking this could set online education back 20 years. And in fact, what they're seeing in the school boards is that very, very few students, if given the choice, will take an online course. Mm -hmm. They want the face-to-face, they want Mm -hmm. the interaction, they want and need the interaction and face-to-face. So I do believe to some extent- Sorry, Donna. To some extent, I do believe we've had a setback. It was exactly as I thought would happen, that we would, that fatigue that you talked about also resonated and continues to echo in the kind of choices that we make, um, especially especially the choices that our students are making. One of the other papers um, we produced through this big pandemic study was looking at what happened, the, the labor of learning so and teaching, how the labor of teaching changed over time during the pandemic. And so at the beginning, there was there were all of these sorts of hopes and aspirations and expressions of that, that this would be the great reset in education. This was an opportunity for us to reset the problematic things about education in the first place, right? To think about our accessibility issues, to think about the ways in which we can revision as, uh, 
a system that needs, you know, some rejuvenation to it. This was going to be sort of like the great upset that could help us. But in fact, the discourse changed over time. And what we got was the push to return to normal. It's time to return to normal. And so one of the things we caution around is the ways in which that discourse of the return to normal, in fact, quashed the ability for us to learn moving forward. It stopped us from able to take those things. So we moved from this idea of the Great Reset to just you know, getting back to the way things were. This is what we need is getting people back to normal. And in fact, you know, it introduces problematics around the, you know, the discursive phrase, phrasing of normal in the first place, right, is really deeply problematic, but also the push it gave to us to sort of abandon those, that, that knowledge we've, we've gathered in our experiences. So, so another question that's come in is, Based on the research that you've done and, and where you're heading with this research, to what degree are you seeing evidence of the differential impact that the pandemic has had on learning, specifically the students? So in, in this research in particular, we heard about, it's a really small pool of students, right? Uh, but you couldn't have designed a more diverse population among them. I mean, it was interesting how the, even their experiences were, were differentiated and not, not just my research, but other people's is, you know, saying that the equity issues that have been exposed through the pandemic have been huge, access to technology, access to learning. We heard stories of, of teachers uh, very worried about their students who were at home alone because their parents had to work, they had no option but to work. And so young children managing their own online education in spaces. Um, the, the pandemic has very much, very much raised for us the sorts of discrepancies and inequities that it's, it's made them uh, much more visible to us. But a better question is, what are we doing about those? I mean, in what ways are we taking that in to inform our policy and practice? And in fact, that becomes the place, this is where critical policy studies is really important uh, to, to be looking at those gaps in terms of, we've designed a policy to help people, but who really benefited from it? And how well has that, how well has that served us? One of the things we're looking at, another aspect of the project is to look at, um, Women, women academics work during the pandemic. And so the policies that were put in place to support women academic during the pandemic and to look at the impacts of that. So our first uh, part of the study is sort of just analyzing those policies. But the next obvious step is to talk to women scholars and their experiences and how much did these policies benefit them? Policies around promotion and tenure, policies around work. How much do they in fact create a more equitable workspace for them? Um, those are the questions we have to still ask. I don't think we know that. And there's a risk we move on, right? The risk is we get back to normal and sort of move away from the learning that, that we can have around that. We need people doing this research. Can I ask, and this might not be a fair question to ask here, puts you on, on the spot, but if there was one or two policies mm -hmm regarding higher education that should have that could have emerged from the pandemic based on what you found in your studies what what would they be one or two that policies that we should be thinking about I should have been prepared for that question <laughs> I'm gonna say I'm gonna switch a little bit and say um I'm working with another student and again it's a something we dealt in the project, but they've taken it into their own PhD studies. And that is to, to sort of look at the impacts of uh, federal government policies on international students' access to education. And so the general mobility of international students was deeply impacted, right, through, through the pandemic. Um, and there's sort of like an assumption that, well, they're, they're wealthy students who will find their way. And if it wasn't here, they'll go someplace else. Um, but, but I think that that fails to, to recognize the extent to which, um, again, the pandemic policies brought very, very different experiences for people. And so um, we, we've we opened and closed our borders to students as we've needed to, and we need to sort of revisit the conditions upon which we do that. And so we're hearing more um, concern being raised in communities around the ways in which international students are operating in our in our communities right and, and they've been there's been some really bad labeling of how they're they're taking space of how they occupy space 
Um, and I think we, so, so the pandemic, because of the fragility that we had in, in the economic system in which we rely on international student uh, tuition, I think we need to be spending a lot more time, Donna, post-pandemic, looking at how do we create healthy and vibrant university systems that, um, that are open to, to opportunities of learning in a global world in which we live in which we don't exploit students for their money, in which we recognize the contributions that students make coming from different places. Again, I, I don't think we've done that well. We've been reactionary in terms of it becoming an economic sort of question for us. We were okay with international students participating in our courses online during the pandemic because we wanted their tuition. But, but what about, and then we required them to come here in order to get their credentials. And so, again, this, a sort of whole system around um, what we could learn about how education could be really does need to be revisited and thought about. Melody, I'm, I'm cognizant of the time. We're in the last two minutes. I want to thank you deeply for making the time this evening to, to share your wisdom and your understanding and your research and the work you've been doing with your students. Um, I, I, I speak for myself specifically, it's been a privilege to have a chance to hear you talk about your work and just to learn about the great impact that you're having. And um, it's, it's, it's really been a privilege and an honor to have you here this evening. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, I'd also like as we close the evening off to thank Western alumni for coordinating and supporting Andrew Graham for helping this evening uh, on the technology end and uh, uh, Dr. Vitsko's uh, graduate student, doctoral student, Hanada Matsuma, who, Matsumoto, who is also here, who's been supporting us. I'd like to thank everybody who made the time this evening to join us on this, this speaker series that we offer by the Faculty of Education. At the Faculty of Education, our, our motto is transforming education and transforming lives, and, and Melody's a, a prime example of the kind of work and the kind of people that we have that are doing that. I would encourage you to continue to watch our website and to watch for announcements. And please do consider joining us when we have these community events. Uh, for those of you who are alumni on the phone on the, on this on this webinar this evening, you may be aware. Next year we're celebrating our 50th anniversary as a faculty of education. So stay tuned for more information about events coming up in the future. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Melody. Thank you for joining us, and I wish everybody a good evening. <laughs>